We ask that we would be filled with the oh, full, we're, deep, we're, and clear knowledge of His will in all spiritual so wisdom, and in comprehensive insight <laughs> into the ways and purposes of God, and in understanding and discernment of spiritual things, that we may walk, live, and conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him and desiring to please Him in all things, bearing fruit in every good work, and steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God, with fuller, deeper, and clearer insight, acquaintance, and recognition. We are invigorated and strengthened with all power, according to the might of his glory, to exercise every kind of endurance and patience, perseverance and forbearance with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion, which is the inheritance of the saints, God's holy people in the light. Thank you, Father, that you have delivered and drawn us to yourself out of the control and dominion of darkness, and you've transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of your love, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, which means the forgiveness of our sins. We are earnest and unwearied and steadfast in our prayer life, being both alert and intent in our praying, with thanksgiving, that God may open up a door to us for the word, to proclaim the mystery concerning Christ the Messiah, that we may proclaim it fully and make it clear, speak boldly and unfold that mystery as it is our duty. We behave ourselves wisely, living prudently and with discretion in our relations with those of the outside world, making the very most of the time and seizing and buying up every opportunity. Our speech at all times is gracious, pleasant, and winsome, seasoned as it were with salt, so that we may never be at a loss to know how we have to answer anyone who puts a question to us. Father, I open up this study tonight and I give you the floor. I ask that you would speak through our vocal cords and think through our minds, all of you and none of our flesh, Father. I ask that you would translate this information into revelation so that we can rightly divide the word of truth and rightly apply it so that we can experience great success in life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Last week we read chapter 16, and I think the major takeaway of this chapter was about um, mental programming, but I'll just walk through the chapter from the beginning and just kind of highlight the, the big points. Once you're born again, the rest of the Christian life is learning to walk in the Spirit. You do that by letting what God has done through the new birth dominate you more than your physical and emotional realm. It's simple but not easy. It's difficult because you must perceive your spirit by faith in God's word, which means putting your face in front of the word, because it's not something you can see or feel or touch or interact with just easily. You must shift from walking by sight or sense knowledge to walking by faith or revelation knowledge. And that means that you have to train your flesh to focus in on the word. And that takes effort. And that's why it's not, it's simple but not easy. The devil is flesh oriented, working through carnal natural things. He tempts you not to believe God by using the things that you can see and feel. Uh, one, on the other hand, the Lord, the Lord operates in the spirit realm, primarily through his word. Due to the nature of this intense, continual inner conflict, you can't just do what you want to do. Either your spirit will dominate you or your flesh will instead. Being baptized into the death of Jesus is automatic. It happens when you receive salvation, that your old man um, is crucified at the cross, just like Jesus. But walking in the Spirit is not automatic. You have to choose to do that by applying the Word. Man manifesting newness of life is something that should happen, but it depends on how to the degree you renew your mind. Your spirit died to sin, your, your old spirit. It cannot sin and has no desire for sin, but this does not automatically mean that your soul and body will reflect that change. Your old man was crucified, has died, and is now gone, but its effects are still being felt through your physical body and unrenewed mind. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to recap this section, um, uh, One Nature, Two Minds, because I think this is an important takeaway. What page is it on here? 108. 114 in the other book. Right here. When you were born again, your old sin nature left behind a body. That's why you still feel a drawing towards sin, even though you're dead to it. Your old man was crucified, has died, and now is gone, but its effects are still being felt through your physical body and unrenewed mind. Your natural mind is programmed to act like the child of the devil that you were before receiving the Lord. 
You were taught how to be selfish, angry, lustful, critical, greedy, bitter, and to do all the other old sins that you did. But now that you're born again, your Heavenly Father has adapted you into His family and given you a brand new righteous nature. However, your old man left behind a body. This means your physical mind will continue functioning like a computer under its prior programming until you renew it to God's Word. You have one nature, but two minds. If you think you have both the old nature and a new one inside, you're going to think you are two different people at once, and that's schizophrenic. You only have one nature, the new one, but you do have two different minds, the unrenewed mind of the flesh and the mind of Christ, or otherwise known as your spirit man. The key to reprogramming your physical mind to agree with your spiritual mind. The spirit is always for God, always thinks on who you are in Christ, always considers what you have in the Lord, and always believes in what you can do in him. As you renew your natural mind to think like your spirit, you'll experience the life and power of God within you. Um, you've been programmed wrong and need reprogramming. The voices in your environment are constantly challenging you to believe, not to believe what your spirit man says. Due to this, you manifest the life of God from your spirit only to varying degrees, depending on how well you renew your mind. Your physical mind decides whether you'll be dominated by your spirit or your flesh. And we talked about this a little bit last week when Tim, I think, mm -hmm. um, well, asked me, how do, you, how do you, when your flesh wants to do one thing, how do you, I think his question was essentially, how do you choose to do something else or something different? Mm -hmm. And I just basically said, well, it just boils down to the fact that you have to make a choice. And then you have to execute that choice. Um, okay. You must get into God's word and mix it with faith in order to be led by your spirit. There's no longer any sinful nature inside of you that you're warring against. The old man is dead and gone. What you are warring against is established patterns of thinking and acting. Your old sin nature isn't there forcing you to do things like before you were born again, like this idea of being born into original sin, and now you, you know, this idea that you have a tendency to sin because you were born into it. That is no longer true if you are born again. If you are a born again Christian, your old nature has died, was crucified with Christ. Now there's still some old programming at play in your natural mind and in your flesh, so sin still exists in you, but your, nat your nature is not to sin. So your old sin nature isn't there forcing you to do things like before you were born again. You've just acted on these negative things and have had them reinforced by the carnal world around you so often that they've become established patterns of thinking and acting. If you're born again, you are not evil inside. You just need to reprogram your mind to God's way of thinking and acting. Jesus has set you free. The old man is dead and gone. If you are not manifesting your freedom in every area of life, it's because you're ignorant of it. Okay. What's true of your what's true of the Holy Spirit is also true of your born again spirit because they are one. So if they, to talk about your to describe your born again spirit is synonymous with to describe the Holy Spirit, same character, same ability. Okay, and I'm going to read the last paragraph of the chapter. The thoughts, desires, patterns, and habits that were established in you through the old sinful nature will begin to diminish as you choose to be dominated by your spirit instead. You don't have to continue in bondage to lust, alcohol, hatred, drugs, strife, gossip, depression, sickness, discouragement, disease, poverty, or anything else that's ungodly. You can break all of those things off because in your spirit you're already free. It's just a matter of renewing your mind and beginning to see who you are in Christ manifest. As this happens, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I don't think we'll read it in this chapter, but turn to chapter 18 just briefly because this ties in really nicely. Um, I'm, um, in chapter 18, the second paragraph, darkness is simply the absence of light. You can't get rid of darkness by shoveling it out of the room. However, if you turn on a light, it'll flee. When you walk in the spirit, so you intentionally make choices to walk in the spirit, you turn on the light. 
by default, as a byproduct, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh because the darkness flees. Willpower is the shovel of the flesh. If you feel you can't really accept who you are in Christ until after you overcome the darkness in your life, for example, drinking, cussing, smoking, or whatever problems you currently have, you'll just end up frustrated and stuck. It's not that God won't release his power to you, it's just that you haven't yet flipped the switch. Lay down the shovel and turn on the light. Get into God's word and start recognizing and meditating on who you are in Christ. As you focus your attention continually on the reality of your new identity, the brightnesses of who you are in the spirit will begin to shine in and through you to such a degree that it will break the control of the flesh and deliver you from these external problems. Um, and I just want to draw attention to Galatians 5.16. This is the first paragraph of chapter 18. Um, I'm just going to read the second half here. This verse, so the verse says, walk in, Galatians 5.16 says, Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. This verse does not say walk in the flesh and you'll hinder the spirit or overcome the flesh and you'll walk in the spirit. It declares just the opposite. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. There are, there's a school of thought that believes that if I uh, overcome my flesh, in my flesh, meaning if I discipline my flesh, if I walk a holy life, if I live a holy life, if I do all these works-based righteousness, if I walk out my righteousness through my own works, if I live holy, then I'm walking in the Spirit. And that's not true. You can live as holy as a life as you, as you can, but still does not equal walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is getting into God's Word and recognizing and meditating who you are in Christ. That's walking in the Spirit. So just disciplining your flesh doesn't make you walk in the Spirit. The opposite is true. You walk in the spirit, and then the flesh falls off. Yes. The tendencies of the flesh. Okay. So we are going to go to chapter 17 tonight, and we're going to, let's pop our Bibles open to Romans 7, just as a jump off point. Somebody to read um, 18 through 23, chapter 7, 18 through 23. Dee, do you have it? Yes. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwell no good thing. For the will to do what is right is present within me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I desire to do, I do not do, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Was that all the way to 23? Oh. No, keep going. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who does it, but sin that lives in me. I find then a law that when I desire to do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God according to the inner man. But I see another law in my members, warning against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Keep going. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind I serve the law of God, but with my flesh the law of sin. Beautiful. Thank you. So, somebody explain this chunk of scripture um, in the context of spirit, soul, and body. When he references, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, what part of our, spirit, what part of our being, spirit, soul, or body, is he referencing? Spirit. spirit. Okay. If he, when he references another law in my members, Warring against the law of my mind. Soul, flesh. Flesh, yeah. Yep. And then, um, final question, which is similar to the last one I just asked you. 
And when he says, evil is present within me, where is that evil present? Soul. And flesh. flesh. Not spirit. The spirit. Okay, very good. So, he's saying, in my inward man, I want to do the right thing. He's referencing in his spirit man. In his renewed nature, he wants, to, your renewed nature is the word of God, right? It wants to do what the word of God, everything that's in the word is what your spirit wants to do. It 100% agrees with the word of God. But, the good that I will to do, that I want to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I would not do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He's saying, my desire, like in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus asked his disciples to pray for him, to stay up and pray for an hour, and then they started to pray, and then they fell asleep because they were tired. And Jesus came back, and what did he say to them? Does anyone know? Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's right. So Jesus was saying, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. So he, same concept is, your spirit wants to do the right thing, but your flesh has evil in it, and it has evil tendencies, because it's been trained to operate according to those evil tendencies, and those thoughts, and those patterns, and those behaviors for a long time. So your flesh will default to what it's been trained to do for so long in the absence of you choosing to walk by the Spirit. So it's a, a choice that you have to make moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. And many times, you can walk through the day doing the right thing and get off track and need to give yourself a course correction. It's a constant redirection to stay in the Spirit. Okay. Who's reading? Debbie? You can skip the first section because it's going to come up again. The first um, scripture. The one that's goofy. Oh, oh the S. Yeah, yeah, skip the italicized yeah, like, version. That one I can't read yeah. anyways. That just doesn't work. <laughs> Paul acknowledged this born-again spirit, but declared, There is no good thing in my flesh. My unrenewed mind and physical body, all the external parts of me functioning independent from Christ. There's nothing good about that. I'm going to have to lay this flesh down and receive a new body and a new soul, which are completely renewed and think exactly like God. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find that a law that when I do, <laughs> when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay, one more question. Um, this, where it says, now if I do that, what, that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Is this saying that you can say, is, is this exclude him from culpability when he makes a choice to do something that's not according to what his spirit man wants him to do? Meaning, you always know right from wrong. And you can always choose one side or the other side. If you choose to be on the wrong side of that right-wrong equilibrium, does it mean that it's not your fault for making that choice because it's the sin that's in you that's forcing you to do it? Because that's what it sounds like he's saying. It sounds like he's saying, oh, I'm, I don't want to do that. It's just the sin that's in me that's at play here. Right, but it says you choose. God has given us a free will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just like that verse that says choose life. Yeah, you can make your choice. choice. Deuteronomy 30, 19. That, I just love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 2 Corinthians 6, 12. Mm -hmm. And 10, 23, I think. I think so. <laughs> yes, so he's not saying, let me read it in this version. Oh, did you, what did you say it was? 2 Corinthians 6, 12. It's second or first? Oh, it's better to look because you're online. 
you're telling somebody. Okay, tell me if it's first or I second Corinthians. Right now. I think it's second, but. Um, um, what verse is that? Yeah, so it's verse 20 that I was asking about. In the New King James, it says, Now, if I do what I will not to do, yep. it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I'm asking, does this mean then that you could throw your hands up in the air and say, well, I want to do the right thing, but I can't because sin is operating in me. And it's not me, it's the sin in me. Absolutely not. <laughs> well, then you got to show me a scripture. I mean, I like you and all, Eric, but I can't take your word to the bank. So. Well, if you read further, like Paul's talking about that in 7, I know if you go into 8 and 9, he addresses that. Um, but I was just looking for that. I didn't find the scripture. Did you find it yet? What do you, what, it's it's 612. 612. Is it first? Okay. It's got to be our say it, isn't it? Okay, 1 Corinthians 612. Can you read? Everything is permissible, allowable, and lawful for me, but not all things are helpful, good for me to do, expedient and profitable when considered with other things. Everything is lawful for me, but I will not become the slave of anything or be brought under its power. Okay, so that scripture says, I'll not be brought under the power of any, is the new King James Version. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any, is the new King James Version of that scripture. And it basically is saying that sin no longer has any authority or control over you. Actually, it never really did. You still have a free will to make a choice. So. And it backs it up. 1 Corinthians 10, 10 23. Yep. What does that say? All things are lawful for me. Because you don't want to take just one scripture. You want it to flow like the... Okay. Um, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And in the Amplified Version of this, Romans 7.20, it gives a little bit more insight. Now, if I do what I do not desire to do, it is not, no longer I doing it, it is not myself that acts, but the sin principle which dwells within me, fixed and operating in my soul, which we know is our mind. So it, sin can influence your thought patterns and your decision-making behavior, right? It can, it, your sin still operates in your mind. So it's still, you're still culpable for your decisions, mm -hmm. but your decision-making process can be altered by sin. Okay. Moving on? Yes, moving on. Sounds a lot like what we wrote in, in Galatians 5.17. For the flesh lusteth after the spirit, and the spirit after, against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Romans 7.24 summarizes Paul's dismal dilemma. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? My associate, Don Crow, has an excellent message from this passage entitled USDA Choice Flesh. He goes into much more detail than I hear. Don preached at the minister's conference and literally changed people's entire attitude toward what these scriptures are really communicating. I encourage you to get a hold of it. Without supernatural assistance, Romans 7 doesn't teach that Paul was constantly trying and failing to do the right thing. He wasn't describing his present Christian life and saying that this is the way it, that it is. Paul wasn't confessing that after all these years, he was still struggling with lust, sexual sin, anger, and bitterness. Neither was he saying, you have this flesh and try as you might, but you can never beat it. Paul was simply describing the inability of the flesh, your physical ability, natural mind, emotions, and actions, all independent from Christ to please God. You cannot overcome your flesh on your own. You have to start living from who you are in Christ. Your spirit man is completely changed and infused with the life of God. You can only please him through living by your spirit. The Christian life isn't just difficult to live. It's impossible. In your flesh, you can't do what the Lord has told you to do. He's commanded you to just bear it when someone insults you. If they slap you in the face, you're to turn the other cheek. If they sue you and take away your coat, you're to give them your cloak as well. 
If someone forces you to carry their burden one mile against your will, go two miles. Matthew 5, 39-41. Your natural self, independent of God, just won't do things like that. It's natural to be self-serving, self-seeking, and self-promoting. If someone slaps you on the cheek, you want to hit both of theirs. If someone takes something from you through a lawsuit, you want to hire the best lawyer and sue them back. But, that, but the Lord's told you, do the opposite. Without supernatural assistance, it's impossible to do what Jesus commands. That's why Paul declared, it's no longer me that lives, but Christ who lives through me. Galatians 2.20. 490. There's a tremendous amount of liberty that comes from recognizing and releasing Christ in you. You don't have to say it in the flesh, well, I will to love you, and turn the other cheek through the gritted teeth. It's much better to pray, Father, in myself, I'd like to knock the block off. My flesh can't do this. Paul described this in Romans 7. But in my spirit, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have the same spirit that Jesus had when he hung on the cross and forgave very, the very people who crucified him. You read that in God's word and believed it. Father, I don't feel like this right now, but I know that my spirit is the same one that enabled Jesus to extend mercy to those who mocked him. In the natural, I can't do this. Father, please live through me now. Give me a supernatural compassion for this person that, so that I can love them. Peter thought he was being very generous when he asked, How many times should I forgive my brother? Up to seven times a day? Jesus answered, Not seven times, but seventy times seven. That's four ninety times in one day. This was his way of communicating that there shouldn't be a limit on your forgiveness. Matthew 18, 21 through 22. The Lord wants you to forgive totally as much and as many times as it takes. In your flesh, you might be able to forgive a person for some minor things once, twice, or even seven times in a day. Peter thought he might be able to do that. But what Jesus asked goes far beyond your human ability. The only way that you can forgive like that is by saying, Father, I can't do it, but you can. Lord, please love them through me. When you humble yourself, turning away from your own natural ability and to God and his divine ability, you'll discover a supernatural strength flowing through you. You have an unlimited supply of God's kind of love in your spirit. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth it's not itself and is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemingly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in her iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7 His love never fails, verse 8. In your spirit you have an unlimited ability to forgive, endure, believe, and hope. If you catch yourself remarking, I can't put up with this person anymore, I just can't take it. I'm at the end of my rope. What you're really saying is, I've come to the end of my flesh. That's good. Now let your spirit take over. You can do. Pray, God, I'm sorry. I've been trying this in myself, which is why I'm burned out, frustrated, and angry. Forgive me and live your life through me. I believe your word. In the spirit, I am a brand new person. If I would walk in the spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then start meditating on who you are and what you have in Christ. By faith, this is who I choose to believe I am. That's renewing your mind and releasing the supernatural life of God out of your spirit into your soul and body. When your physical mind comes into agreement with your spiritual mind, you can literally begin to hope, endure, and believe in things that you couldn't have done by your natural self. I've been able to love the many different people who have come up against me. A guy I was witnessing to spat in my face. People have tried to physically assault me. Some other well-known ministers publicly called me a cult leader and of the devil. Guy stole 20,000 from our ministry. I've even been kidnapped and had threats on my life. But in all this and more, I can truly tell you that I have nothing against any of these people. I harbor no evil thoughts and never spend any time ever thinking about them. I've completely forgiven each and every one. How? I renewed my mind to God's word and released the love and forgiveness that's in my spirit. You can do it too. Releasing your true identity. You can't please God if you're in the flesh. Romans 7 describes living by your own natural carnal ability. That's why the results are defeat, failure, and an inability to do the desired good. Romans 7, 19. 
in your flesh you can't overcome, turn the other cheek, or forgive an unlimited number of times. That's why Paul said in his flesh, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7, 24. In other words, Paul asked, who will deliver me from this flesh? The very next verse contains the answer. I thank God through Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 7, 25. Deliverance from the flesh comes through living by who you are in the spirit. From here, Paul launches right into Romans 8 with, there is therefore. Therefore refers back to what has previously been said, which is that the flesh cannot please God. Romans 7. Therefore you must walk after the Spirit. Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8. 1. Your spirit is the only part of you in Christ Jesus. If you are in the Spirit, there is no condemnation to you whatsoever. That's good news. Romans 8 is one of the most victorious chapters in the whole Bible. Why? It's written from the perspective of your born-again spirit. The frustration of living after the flesh described in Romans 7 is not the typical Christian life. Romans 7 speaks of a person trying to please God through their natural effort. Oh God, I'm trying to do better. I want to do better, but I just can't. Why? It's important, impossible to serve God in the flesh. The word spirit is only used once in Romans 7. In contrast, it's used 21 times in Romans 8. In, it's Romans 8 that describes a typical Christian life. You've got to get over into the spirit. This revelation of spirit, soul, and body unlocks so much of the Christian life. How can you live in the spirit if you don't know that it was your spirit that changed? When you understand that, you can begin comprehending that who you are and what you have in Christ doesn't fluctuate based on your performance. How can you release something you don't know and don't believe you have? Once you do believe, you must reject the flesh and walk by who you are in the spirit. Cultivate a good image of who you are in Christ, and let that become the real you. It's just a matter of discovering and releasing the true identity. An extroverted introvert. Through this, God's done a miracle in my life. I was extremely introverted before being turned on to the Lord. Because of nervousness and self-consciousness, I couldn't look someone in the face and talk without stammering. Now, God has me speaking to millions of people daily through television and radio. I minister to people face to face in meetings all around the world, sometimes up to 5,000 at once. Yet I'm not afraid because it doesn't bother me anymore. I'm focused on who I am in the spirit. My flesh is the same as it always was. I still have a tendency to be introverted. In fact, when I'm not focused on the Lord and someone catches me in the flesh, I still want to withdraw, not exert myself, and just go sit in the background. This natural part of me hasn't changed. Most people think they're improving their flesh when they're born again. That's simply not true. You don't improve your natural self through the Christian life. You just become better at denying it. The improvement comes by choosing to recognize your new identity in Christ and letting those thoughts and actions manifest from your spirit. When I take personality tests now, I always score the maximum in every category for extroverts. That's who I've chosen to be and who I've become in Christ. It's who my born-again spirit is. If you could somehow test me apart from my godly reactions, you'd find I'm still an introvert in my flesh. Living from the spirit. The Christian life isn't your natural flesh becoming stronger in godliness so that you don't need the Holy Spirit as much as when you first began. Rather, it's growing stronger in the spirit and weaker in the flesh. The flesh's dominance steadily diminishes as you learn to con consistently depend on and draw out more of what's in your spirit. Focus on who you are in the spirit by meditating on God's word, and your flesh will bow the knee to the spirit's rule and reign. Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth after the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that ye you, you can, you cannot do the things that ye would. Galatians 5, 16-17. You'll break the control of the flesh as you base your identity and potential on what the Word says about who you are in Christ. Instead of being controlled by your old carnal self, your spirit man will begin to dominate. My flesh is still basically timid and shy, but my spirit is as bold as a lie. Proverbs 28.1 Some people who travel on airlines 
push their way up to the counter, make demands whenever something goes wrong. I'm quite the opposite. I actually set my travel agent cards aside and begin because the ticket agents almost never grant me any of those discounts. I'm just not a pushy guy. Yet I can be very bold and assertive when it comes to my spiritual matters. Anything else that is of value to me. People have challenged me in services before, but it's like the spirit of might comes upon me and I just take care of it. Isaiah 11, 2. That's because I've learned how to live more from my spirit than my flesh. Okay, so the key point here is right back in a couple of paragraphs back. Um, it's the second one, two, third paragraph in this section, an extroverted introvert. Most people think they're improving their flesh when they're born again. That's simply not true. You don't improve your natural self through the Christian life. You just become better at denying it. The improvement comes by choosing to recognize your new identity in Christ and letting those thoughts and actions manifest from your spirit. And then in this paragraph, living from the spirit, a couple sentences in. I'll just read it from the beginning. The Christian life isn't your natural flesh becoming stronger in godliness so that you don't need the, need the Holy Spirit as much as when you first began. Rather, it's growing stronger in the spirit and weaker in the flesh. The flesh's dominance steadily diminishes and you learn to consistently depend on and draw out more of what's in your spirit. How do you do that? Focus on who you are in the spirit by meditating on God's word and your flesh will bow the knee to the spirit's rule and reign. Instead of being controlled by your old carnal self, your spirit man will begin to dominate. Now, I thought that the faith to faith from today was very fitting in this topic. So if you have access to it on your phone or what have you, you can pull it up. Otherwise, I'll just read it to you. The scripture is, um, there's two. We're going to go to James 4, 8 and then to Revelation 3. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, this, this is what the faith that they says for today. Remember when you first got into the Word and were so excited about the things of God? Remember when you could hardly wait to read the next chapter in the Bible or listen to the latest teaching tape? That there was only one word to describe you, hot. Your reborn spirit was on fire for God. When Ken and I first heard the message of faith, we were like that. We were so on fire that nothing else in the world interested us. We had learned that we could trust God's word, just like we could trust the word of a close friend, and we were hungry to find out everything he had promised us in his word. Back then, it seemed all I did was read God's word. I read faith books, I listened to tapes, I was dedicated. My total interest was in the word of God. But slowly that changed. At first, I didn't even realize it was happening. Then the Holy Spirit went to work on me and showed me that I had grown lukewarm. I had let the fire die down. I still read the word, but I had lost my enthusiasm. Maybe you've had the same experience. If so, I want to tell you how to get that fire back. It worked for me, and it will work for you. God's word says to draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. In order to do that, you will have to first drop the things that are stealing your time from reading the word. Delight yourself in his word. Become diligent again. If you will give your attention to the things of God, soon your desire for God will increase. Your desire will follow your attention. The more you attend to something, the more your desire is drawn to give attention to that thing. I can show you that this in I can show you that this is a natural principle. If you play golf, you'll go for months at a time without even thinking about it. Then one day you'll make time in your schedule to go to the course and play a round or two. The next day you may want to play again. Your desire gets stronger and stronger the more you play. The same thing will happen in the spirit realm. Your soul's desire will follow whatever you spend your time doing. Start building yourself up by praying in the spirit. Believe and act on everything God says to you. Before long, that flicker that's been wavering in your spirit will grow again into an all-consuming fire. So the lukewarm church is addressed in Revelation 3. 
starting at verse 15. Bren, you want to read it for me? Sure, when I get there. That's why I picked you, mm -hmm. circling back for the last man. No, no man left behind. Uh, Revelation 3, what? 13? Uh, 15. Oh, 15. I know your record of works and what you are doing. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered and grown wealthy, and I am in need of nothing. And you do not realize and understand that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore I counsel you to purchase from me gold refined and tested by fire, that you may be truly wealthy and white clothes to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nudity from being seen and salve to put on your eyes that you may see. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults and convict and convince and reprove and chasten. I discipline and instruct them. So be enthusiastic and in earnest and in burning with zeal and repent, changing your mind and attitude. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and listens to and heeds my voice and opens the door, I will come into, into him and will eat with him and he will eat with me. He who overcomes is victorious. I will grant him to sit beside me on my throne, as I myself overcame, was victorious, and sat down beside my father on his throne. He who is able to hear, let him listen to, and heed what the Holy Spirit says to the assemblies, the churches. Thank you. So, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So, if you are finding yourself in a place where you've wandered away, um, God says, this is how you get back on. Start giving me more attention, and then your desire mm -hmm. for me will grow, and then you'll get back on track. Just thought that fit in well. Okay. Any other takeaways from this chapter that spoke to you? Can sin still control you? Can sin influence your thinking? Can it influence your decision making? You know, when it talks about, you know, I like, I'm the type, I like to get word pictures of things, you know what I'm talking about? You get a word picture of something, and it helps to remind you of what not to do or what to do. Okay, and this comes to me, and it says that, Oh, wretched man, and this is Romans 7, 24, and Paul is talking about, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the, from the body of this death? And in the Amplified, Oh, unhappy and pitiable and wretched man that I am. Who will release and deliver me from the shackles of this body of death? But to get a picture of that, what they did back in biblical times, if you killed somebody, they took that body, that dead body, and they strapped it to your back. And eventually it killed you. Because it, I taught about this a long time ago. But it, it decays, and it decays your flesh. So Paul is liken himself to a dead man when he is operating in the flesh. It will eat away to his body. And you know how you brought, and this morning I was looking that up a little bit, with neither hot nor cold, I'll spill you out of your, my mouth. There's so many things that God cannot do for us because we really don't know him and we really have been lukewarm or even cold at times 
and we do our own thing instead of do what God has shown us to do. We serve the flesh. And this is exactly what the enemy wants, if you really look at it. Because this, this has really grieved my heart to think of the churches that have closed down, selling buildings. But, um, and I know, said somebody today, they're at home just watching church online. We become lazy, we become lukewarm because God, he commands us to meet weekly and that's why when the churches through Paul and different ones, they were going through a lot of problems, you know, the devil was after them all the time. They met underground, they met in houses, they snuck around because they knew how important it was to meet together. So now the devil, really, just look at this, the devil has the born again Christian and he's really taken the church and put the church down. And I was talking to somebody about this on Tuesday morning. They were questioning and we were talking about it. And I said, we get lukewarm. We may even get cold because now we're looking at ourselves instead of looking at God. We're serving our flesh instead of serving God. And then, you know, when I was reading that about putting food away because at times will be hard and stuff like that, the Lord said, that is not physical food. I am saying put away spiritual food inside of you so that you get the word so that if something happens, bang, you can come up against it. You know, as fast as, as like um, little Joey and um, with Levi, what happened? You had the word in you and you immediately kicked it into place. Otherwise, I don't think you would have, I think you'd have two boys that are dead, that would, be a, would have been dead. And, um, you know, when you look at different things and everybody has went through something, but when we're neither hot nor cold or lukewarm, whatever, when something comes our way, do we have that spiritual food that we can attack the enemy and get, off, get him off of our backs? Or are we, have we strapped ourselves with our own desires? Have we, and our own desires, I'm gonna go out and do whatever I want. They're strapping a dead man to themselves and that will eat their flesh away. And that's an example, but when I say eat the flesh away, I mean it will affect your mind, it'll affect your body, it'll affect your family. It'll affect your children. So it's, it's, it all, it all runs together. And when I see that, I think it's a pastor in California fighting for it. I'm just like praying for him and, mm -hmm. you know, you send these people money and because you want to see them have the victory. And that's what we're doing all over. We're fighting for the church. Mm -hmm. But how many people have become dead bones, Christians? Oh, God's in control. Is he in control? Who is in control? We are. And, and I mean, it's scripture after scripture after scripture. I led my, my cousin to the Lord the other day, and uh, I'm talking, she, she was asking me questions because of me being a pastor. And I was just answering, and all of a sudden it got to the salvation. And I introduced, and she's a starch Catholic. And she accepted Jesus. Mm -hmm. And she still was asking more questions, but I had the answers to give her. And like, she was like, wow. She didn't, you know, I picked her up and, uh, brought over to my house and then we went for lunch and then she asked if I'd come into her apartment for a while, you know. She just wasn't ready to let go because she was, she's going to be 90. And I mean, you saw her, she's got a lot of spitfire in her, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. You'd never know that. You'd never know it. But it's something she's been looking for and she didn't know she was looking for it. 
And I say all that to say, we've got to train ourselves up to be ready in season and out of season. If we're not, that dead man is strapped to us and we may lose our children, we may lose our spouse, we may lose some, you know what I'm saying? Or, or your money, which is the least of it, God says. But to take the word of God as spiritual food, and like you hear me say, it's delicious. Get that word in you because you can change and frame your world, you can change your children. Like I was telling Carol, my cousin, I said, there isn't anything in that Bible. No, how did I say that? I said, everything that you need to raise children, work a job, treat your husband, treat your children, is all in that Bible. She said, really? I said, it's all in the Bible. And you know what? You read it and every year, it's like, this is more for me than even before because you're finding out more answers. But it's just delicious to think that I can get this word. We know it's in me, but I want to draw it out. But I want to get understanding so that I know how to use it and when to use it. So that the devil can't steal from me. Because um, we know that the middle of October now, Trump's got something awesome coming down. How many people are going to receive it? Yes. How many people are really looking at what's happening to our country. How many people are really, really, really doing that you know? There are a lot of people, but there are people that, oh, I don't know, Biden would be good too. And it just makes you wanna cry because you say, I'll take you to Venezuela and you tell me if you like Biden's way. Because you know, but they don't know. Same things, when you know the word, you defeat the enemy, the enemy does not defeat you. Amen. So anyway, to me that was important because when Paul was talking about this dead man, the body of this dead man, the example of taking that person you killed, strapping him on your back, and it is going to decay and it's going to kill you as well. That's what sin does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. you know, my brother Daryl being gay, it killed him with AIDS. Mm -hmm. So, and look at me with the alcohol. That would have, well, it killed my sister Vaughn. So, that's not a very good track record, is it? So anyway. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing, you know, when it for, about forgiving people, I was talking to somebody and they said to me, you guys don't know this person. And they said, Pastor Jan, I'm trying to forgive this person. And I do it and I just can't. And that's why my life is on standstill because I can't forgive. And I looked and I said, shut up. And she looked, I said, shut up. You're into emotions. The only thing you have to say is I forgive them by faith, mm -hmm. right? I forgive them by faith. And every time that feeling comes up in you, what do you do? Nope, I've already forgiven them. Even though you still have anger. And eventually it'll come around. I know I've done it. Mm -hmm. But we think we have to have the feely touchy with things. That, that's not, we don't. <coughs> so anyway, that's it. Do you have a tie there and offering this event? We don't have to pass the bucket. Does anyone have a testimony? I'm looking at you, Brenda. What Didn't you, got, you Brenda? give me one this week? I gave you one. Hi there, Eric. <laughs> well, it was an attitude adjustment is really what it was all about. But I had um, several things go, just don't know her well enough yet go wrong, meaning the coil in the furnace went out, which meant I didn't have AC. Then it was my water heater. Mm. That leaked. Then it was the tube in the TV just blown. I had sound but no picture. And the refrigerator was leaking onto my carpet floor. And I was feeling a little down. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Until the Lord just kind of tapped me on the shoulder and he reminded me. He said, because I have an emergency fund. He's like, and who provided that emergency fund for you? And I'm like, you're right, Lord. I need to start looking at this from the spirit man and not mm -hmm. <laughs> from my flesh. And so um, as I walked through those things, my emergency fund was gone. And when it was gone, I'm like, okay, Lord. <laughs> and he, when it came to repairing my refrigerator, I had called the company and they sent a repair guy and it was no charge. And then on, as far as the TV, I got a really good um, deal on the TV and Aaron helped me mount it down the wall. And so, I mean, just things just started, once I changed my attitude, yep, yep. things started to turn around. So yes. that's my testimony. Mm -hmm. I gotta give my testimony again, that is about my, my dishwasher rack, the top one. When I called and ordered it, right? It's under guarantee for Sears. So I called and ordered it. 11 days went by and I called again and they put me on hold one and I was irritated. No. <laughs> That's just not you. <laughs> and at the end I apologized. I apologized to the guy and turned around. The thing still didn't come. I called again. They click, click, click me. And I said, no. No, I am not going to get angry. I'm getting that part. Well, I had to call a third third time. Mm -hmm. Put me on hold. Mm -hmm. Finally, I said, no, I'm not going to get it. I'm going to get that dishwasher. If I don't get it now, I'll go out and buy a new dishwasher. I'm just done with this. I'm not going to. But make a long story short, the gal came on there, and she ordered the part. Well, the second one ordered the part, send the wrong part. First one sent the wrong part. The second one sang, sent the wrong part. The third one I got on sent me the right part. Now that was August 24th. October 2nd, they're going to come, and the piece that I have, they're going to repair it. But when I stopped getting ticked, all of a sudden, it just, but my anger was holding it back. And that may seem simple to some people, but it's not. It's, it just was holding me back. And I knew it because when I decided nope, and I was being nice to that girl, and, and I said something, and I said, I apologize. I said, I'm just, I just want it now. She said, if that makes you feel good to get mad at me, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been a Christian woman. That must have been what? Must have been a Christian woman. Yeah. Well, one of the gals I was talking to and found out her husband died a couple of years ago and she was having, well, she's a really starch Catholic. She listens to, who was a guy again? Um, uh, Joel Olstein. And she's got kids. And so just on ordering a part, we're going back and forth. and. She hated to hang up. She said, I hate to hang up, but we have to go. So anyway, just because I let go of that anger, it was done. Mm -hmm. So then the devil was still trying to get me angry by it taking so long to come and repair it. I don't care. It'll get repaired. Or I'll go get a new one. <laughs> there. So I have a testimony, too. Um, my, my dad... Um, my brother had called me up maybe one, maybe last, it was last week, no, the week before, and said, well, I didn't talk to him, because then he said to text to me, and he said, call dad, he, I hear him sneezing, and I, you need to call him, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to call my brother back, because I know what path he's going to go down with this whole story, so we, so then he started sending out texts like, you need to tell dad, he needs to get the test. And then he was, he's sending it to me and my sister. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'm gonna call dad. And I, what I asked him was, is there anything that I need to do in particular with dad? Cause he, I know he had something on his mind. That's when he starts spewing out all this stuff about um, he needs to take the test. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna call dad. So I called my dad up and I said, dad, I heard that you had some symptoms. What symptoms do you have? And he said, oh, I'm just feeling, I just have this sneeze, this cough. 
And um, I'm like, okay. So I'm like, well, can I pray for you? And um, he let me pray for him. And um, I'm like, well, let, and then I talked to his caregiver. I'm like, Jamika, what's going on? Let me, could you tell me what's going on with my dad? And I kind of, and he also said his leg was hurting him. So I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, Jamika, could you get, I had sent some um, X39 patches and they're supposed to help with, um, help your body out mm -hmm. to heal. Circulation. So um, I told her to, I'm like, go find those, could you get those patches and put one on my dad? And she did that. I'm like, Dad, you need a patch on. So I talked to her a little bit about that. Then um, I, <laughs> I sent back a text message. I'm like, yeah, I talked to Dad. Um, he said he had these symptoms, and I prayed for him. And of course, well, I got the flack of, well, you know, prayer's good, but. <laughs> and I got that back from my um, brother, and he went on talking about this whole. I, I was like, I'm not going to call him up because. What I do know is I'm going to just diffuse this by just speaking the word of God to them every time they come up with something. Then my sister and him were going back mm -hmm. with a bit. Then they came back to the word of God at the end of the conversation <laughs> <laughs> after they got everything out that they, so I was, but the awesome thing was before this whole thing started and my, my dad is healed. I called him the next day. He was fine. Amen. So he was healed. And he was fine, and it was nothing where they were where the trail my brother was going. Mm -hmm. But that morning before, at maybe like four or five in the morning, I was listening to the word. You know how you just have the word on certain times as yeah. you're sleeping. Yeah. So I had the word on, and it was like pray for your dad and pray for his caregiver. So I just prayed in the spirit, and then that same day is when all this stuff came out. And it was like as I was going through, walking through this what this day or I mean the day and the night with Texas flying back and forth I was at peace knowing that they were okay mm -hmm. and everything was all right mm -hmm. and they it was because the next day my sister called oh dad's doing fine he's not having any issues praise God and back to equilibrium on the word of God <laughs> <laughs> and no fear Mm -hmm. And Memphis is going to play for another team because there is not enough players for his regular team. So um, I got him registered a few months back and had to use Memphis's card, which now has no money on it. And I'm like, okay, somebody's supposed to get back to me to let me know what his finance situation is going to be if they're going to help out. So I call him a message today and because I was getting anxious, you know, the last couple weeks. And I just, last couple days, I'm like, I'm just going to let it go and it's going to be fine. And I get a text message to, well, he's a goalie. We don't charge for goalies. I'm like, yes, oh. thank you, Lord. Oh. <laughs> right? You get a favor. The, we, um, registration fee I already paid, so. Wow. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Don't charge for goalies. Don't go charge for goalies. <laughs> Amen. So this will be the second season we've not had to pay a hockey fee. Wow. Amen. Amen. Wow. Praise God. <laughs> God is good. If, if that's it, can we pray? I want to pray that the churches all start meeting again and stop fearing over this. Amen. Because Amen. this is, we're not supposed to be hunkering down. You know, we're supposed to be, you know, and not praising and worshiping. And that's so wrong, you know, because what it's doing is, again, the Christians are becoming dry bones. I don't want that. I want the churches up and going and filled to capacity. Amen. Amen. Okay. And then also for the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. okay, that our president, it's between two ladies and, well, you saw both the ladies, mm -hmm. the one she, he was going to suggest a lot last time, I think is what it's going to take. But anything else that we need to pray for? I think our, the Wisconsin um, legislature is mm -hmm. saying that they're going to stand up and fight this new mask mandate. And I, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in them, but I would like to submit them for prayer that they get off their lazy butt and do something this time around. Good. I agree. Do you agree? I agree. Amen. 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 Okay. Do you agree that the churches would start up now and stop this online streaming and bring the people together? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because yeah. it's just going to hurt the people, you guys. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and that's a black eye on all the churches. Okay, and then also for the Supreme um, Justice to fill the Ginridge's spot, and that God would take that right straight through. Amen. Amen. So I plead the blood of Jesus over our president, over this whole situation. Mm -hmm. They are saying, um, and Santa, and what's her name, X-22, and uh, Charlie, her, what they're Charlie. saying is it's going to really get bad because the um, Democrats are so afraid. They're really coming in there. They're doing stupid stuff where they're really tripping themselves up. But there's people getting hurt in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? And we, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus, from coming up against our president and his family and against our Constitution. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Let's yes. pray in the spirit a little bit here. Yeah. 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 Father God, you said of two or more, whatever we ask, you said you would give it to us. We want this new Supreme Court gal, just we want her in place. And it's, it's swiftly, quickly, and quietly. And everything that Trump's going to be bringing out in a couple of weeks, it will come out just perfectly in Jesus' name. And everybody will receive it. Everybody, well, yeah. When yeah. it goes dark and that's the only thing you can see on TV, mm -hmm. they're going to receive it. Amen. And Father, I thank you for it. We've got an agreement. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, are we now, is the communion right there? Or what? Right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can bring it in. Let's go. There you go, sir. Father, we just put you in remembrance that your body was broken on our behalf so that our bodies could be whole. Mm -hmm. And the chastisement of our peace was upon you. By your stripes, we were healed at the cross. Mm -hmm. So what we allow to operate in our flesh today is a thousand percent our choice. Yes. And I choose to reject any scheme of the devil from operating in my body. I break its power because it has none and it has no rightful authority to operate. Mm -hmm. So I command my flesh to get into order with the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It must be this whole lot. There must be, because I feel like I want to bite it. <laughs> <laughs> and we, so, we put so. Jesus in remembrance of his blood that was shed for us for the remission of our sins, so that we can spend eternity in fellowship with God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Yes, Just enough of a little drink. You can do a quiche. You got it. No, I don't think so. Those sealed down. I don't know why. I know it. Interesting. It's just. This is a sign. Thank you, sir. A sign of your kind. Did you get it? Oh, I'm going to get it. I'm just going to put this in. You're going to miss the time limit. Ha, ha, ha.